Every year, thousands of children are affected by illness or injury, so knowing what to do is important, especially if you're a parent. When a child is sick or hurt, it can be a very frightening experience, but how you respond is vital. Basic first aid can often prevent the condition deteriorating or becoming life-threatening. The aim of these short videos is to give you the basic knowledge and skills to know what to do if your child is sick or injured. How you respond in an emergency situation could make the difference between life and death. Gastroenteritis or tummy bugs are a very common problem for children. It's one of the commonest things that we see in the emergency department. Generally it's a viral illness that is self-limiting and resolves itself without any treatment. But we want to tell you when to worry and when to come and seek uh, medical help. Gastroenteritis, the children present with lots of frequent loose poos, sometimes associated with fever and sometimes associated with uh, vomiting. But from your point of view, the most important thing to watch out for is whether the nappies are wet or not. If the nappies become dry, then the child is dehydrated and they need more support. Generally, the support that we give tends to just be oral fluids, which you can give at home as well. But sometimes we give intravenous fluids to help your child recover from this illness. Once your child has this illness, it's important not to spread it to other children, so hand washing at home and avoiding returning to the crash too soon is important so that the illness doesn't spread to other uh, vulnerable children. Most fits are not serious, but you may feel terrified watching it. Small children between the ages of six months to six years are prone to fits with a temperature but most do not have epilepsy. At the start of an illness, as the temperature is rising, a fit can occur. Your child can turn blue, shake dramatically and froth at the mouth. Febrile fits are normally short and resolved by themselves in less than five minutes in most children. Any first fit needs an emergency phone call to get help. It is not likely to be serious, but you cannot be sure. First, you have to manage the fit with a little first aid. When a child has a fit, phone for emergency help, but also gently lie the child on his or her side on the floor in a safe place. Remove any nearby objects. Put nothing in the child's mouth. Note the details, what time the fit began and ended and what does it look like. Check the temperature if you have a thermometer close by, but do not leave the child alone to do this. Most children like to sleep after a fit and this is to be expected, so don't worry. Emergency help should be there soon. Years ago, people held down the tongue during a fish. Do not put anything in the mouth. It may make the child vomit and that can be dangerous. When your child gets to hospital, the doctor will examine your child to look for the source of the temperature. The majority of these are simple viral illnesses which all children suffer from. Some children react to these by having a fish while others don't. It is likely that your child may be sent home and not kept in hospital, but it is important to get your child checked out. Asthma is really common. About one in four kids wheeze at some point. It may be triggered by a viral cold-like illness or in some kids by allergies like pollen. The child may complain of feeling unwell or you might simply notice that they are breathless when talking. You may also notice that they've stopped running or playing because they are short of breath. Look for signs of increased work of breathing, like a faster rate, visible in drawing of the wall of the abdomen just under the ribs, or increased movement of the neck muscles just above the collarbones. You may hear noisy breathing, such as a whistling sound or other abnormal sounds. Any child with asthma should have an action plan. This is a set of instructions for what to do if wheezing starts. This should include using an inhaler, usually this blue one, through a special plastic device called a spacer. A spacer is simply a kind of plastic bottle or box the inhaler is attached to one end and the child's mouth to the other. Younger children may require a spacer with a face mask attachment as this will ensure a good seal. It's really important to use the spacer. It makes it much easier as the spacer holds the medicine in the chamber while the child inhales. To use correctly, shake it, remove the cap and attach it as shown. Then gently hold the mask against the face or the child may put its mouth around the other end of the spacer. Press to release a puff of medicine and watch the child take four breaths. You can observe the valve move with each breath the child takes. The action plan will usually say how many puffs of medicine to give, four or six perhaps, and wait a few minutes. If they are no better, repeat. 
If still no better, seek medical attention as a matter of urgency. Accidents happen, and this is especially so for children. A broken bone is a common injury in a child, especially after a fall. No matter what part might be broken, or how big or small the injury may seem, all broken bones need medical attention. Your child's bone may be broken if you've heard a snap or a crack during the injury, if there is swelling or bruising or tenderness, if they are in a lot of pain, or they are unable to move the injured limb. It's important to keep the injured limb as still as possible. This can be done securing the limb to the body with a scarf or towel or by resting it on a pillow or cushion. Keep your child calm and comfortable by giving them some pain relief and seek medical attention at your nearest hospital as soon as possible. Road-related injuries are the number one cause of death and serious injury in children. To reduce this, Make sure your child is in a correctly fitted car seat or child restraint for every trip. This needs to be age appropriate. Reduce your speed to under 30 km per hour when driving in residential areas and ensure that your child wears a bicycle helmet when cycling on a scooter or a skateboard. Beware of driveway backovers and always watch out for young children when reversing your car. To avoid drowning accidents, make sure your child wears a life jacket if they're in a boat and teach them how to swim at an early age. Never leave a child alone in a bath, even for a minute. Be especially wary of ponds and pools if small toddlers are around. To avoid burns and scalds, always use child-resistant cigarette lighters and never smoke around young children. Have a working smoke alarm in your home and make sure you check it regularly. Beware of hot drinks. Put the milk in first when making tea or coffee to reduce the temperature. Preset the temperature for hot water in baths and never leave an iron or curling iron plugged in or within reach of children. To avoid falls, avoid baby walkers completely. Use stair gates to prevent young children falling down the stairs and window guards to avoid first and second floor falls. To prevent choking, avoid latex balloons. Also avoid drawstrings on children's clothes and pull cords on window blinds. Young children have a tendency to put everything in their mouths, so be vigilant at all times, especially if they're playing with toys that have small parts such as Lego or if there are foods about, like peanuts or popcorn. To reduce the risk of poisoning, keep medicines out of reach of or in child-resistant containers or blister packs. Be wary of household chemicals, button batteries and detergents and make sure they are safely stored away. Croup is a condition that causes swelling to the voice box and the windpipe resulting in a harsh barking cough and hoarse musical sound called strider. Strider is usually more pronounced on breathing in, but can be heard on both breathing in and out. Croup is usually caused by a viral infection and infects children between the ages of six months and five years. Viral croup may start as a runny nose and a low grade fever. The noisy breathing and barking cough frequently present overnight. A child with strider does need a medical review by their GP or in the emergency department. The treatment for croup is usually steroids in liquid form. If the child has strider when they are resting, then they do need medical observation until this resolves. More severe cases can require nebulized therapy. Croup can rarely be life-threatening and in such cases a breathing tube is required to make the child's airway safe. In rare cases, other more serious conditions can mimic croup. Therefore, it is important to get your child seen if they have strider. In Ireland, constipation affects one in every three children. In 95% of cases, there is no known reason for it. This is known as idiopathic constipation. If your child is passing hard, dry stools with difficulty less than three times a week, they may be constipated. If they are also having frequent accidents, they may have impacted stools and are experiencing overflow diarrhea. This can be viewed by some as bad behaviour, but in fact the child has no control over this. If constipation is left untreated, it can lead to anal tears which cause the child pain and in turn lead to holding onto the stool. There are some key points to remember. Know the different types of stool to identify constipation with or without overflow diarrhea. Type 3 and 4 are normal stools. Type 1 is constipated and type 7 with type 1 is constipation with overflow diarrhea. 
Impact of stool must be cleared out with higher doses of laxatives as prescribed by your doctor. After this clear out, maintenance medication must be taken to prevent a build up of stool. A common misconception is that laxatives may make the bowel lazy. This is not true. Keep a diary for a week and look at how much fluid and fibre they are consuming. A typical four year old needs over a litre of fluid and nine grams of fibre a day. Your child should be sitting comfortably on the toilet with an insert and footstool if needed. Feet together with knees level with the belly button and elbows resting on the knees. Gentle pushing down can help the stool out. Blowing bubbles and balloons can cause enough pressure instead of going red in the face. Encourage your child to move around. Exercise of any kind is better than sitting in front of the telly. It will really help the bowels to move. Children that experience hard stools that are sore to pass will often hide in the corner and avoid the toilet. Keeping the stool soft will help and eventually the child will forget the pain. But this will take time. Early detection of constipation is a must. Treatment takes time and effort. Talk to your GP about any concerns that you have. Every day children accidentally injure their mouths and teeth. Injuries can be as simple as bumps and scrapes or as dramatic as knocking out a tooth altogether. Knocking out an adult tooth is a real emergency and here's what you need to know and do. The tooth will have the best chance of survival if it is replaced quickly. This is ideally done within a few minutes. To do this, hold the tooth by the crown, not by the root, clean it under running water and push it back in its socket. You shouldn't touch the root as the cells covering the root are very delicate. Once the tooth is back in place, bite down on some clean fabric or tissue and go to the dentist straight away. If you can't get the tooth back in, put it in milk and get to the dentist immediately. Try to call the dentist on the way to let them know to expect you. Never replace a baby tooth that's been knocked out. If in doubt, put the tooth in cold milk and get to the dentist immediately. As a guide, it's useful to know that most children don't have any adult teeth until six years of age. For most other dental injuries, like fractures and minor displacements, there's no immediate first aid required, but you should give your child pain relief if they need it and call your dentist to arrange to see them as soon as possible. Baby teeth and adult teeth that have been dislodged a little can usually be gently pushed back into place by your dentist and are sometimes held in place with a splint or brace. Broken teeth can be fixed with a filling material and if the inner layers of the tooth are exposed and sensitive, treatment can be carried out to keep the tooth healthy. Seeing your dentist within 24 hours is usually fine for these kinds of injuries. Cuts and scrapes to the lips and gums are quite common. Bleeding is usually controlled by applying pressure with a clean piece of damp fabric or tissue for five minutes. Make sure your child wears a mouth guard and an appropriate helmet for sports such as hurling, camogie, rugby and boxing, and a helmet for activities such as cycling, skating and scooting. Custom fitted mouth guards offer the best comfort, fit and protection. Frequent dental visits from an early age provide you with the opportunity to discuss oral health issues that are important for your child. Most people don't know that dentists recommend that you bring your child for their first visit by their first birthday. It's always good to start early to get the best advice possible. Sunburn is caused by overexposure to the sun and children are especially vulnerable to the sun's strong rays. Sunburn can be avoided by wearing a hat and long protective clothing and by applying a high ultraviolet protection sunscreen on exposed areas. If you think your child has been sunburned, look for three things. Reddening of the skin, pain in the area that has been exposed, and blisters. If your child is under one year of age, seek medical attention immediately, even if the sunburn appears mild, as infants can dehydrate quickly. If your child is older than a year, remove them from the sun immediately. Cool the area down by sponging them with a cool, clean washcloth or soak the area in a bath or shower for no longer than 10 minutes. This can be repeated a few times during the day. Encourage your children to drink plenty of fluids to keep hydrated and give extra fluids for two to three days. If the skin doesn't blister, then the sunburn may be mild and can usually be treated with calamine lotion or an after sun cream, which will soothe the sore skin. When going outside, all sunburned areas should be completely covered to protect the skin until it's fully healed. Clothing should be loose so the burnt area is not irritated. If blisters appear, the burn is more severe and you will need to see a doctor. 
You should also seek medical attention if the sunburn covers a large area, your child has fever or chills, your child has a headache, confusion or feels faint, or you see signs of dehydration. Liquid tabs are an effective detergent when used properly in the washing machine, but as such they contain potentially dangerous chemicals. When children get their hands in the brightly coloured pods, the consequences can be serious. Since the contents of the pods differ between manufacturer, the effects can vary. Once in the hand, the pods can easily burst and leak liquid onto the skin. This can cause problems like rash, pain and burns. If a pod bursts onto the skin, it is important to first remove the pod from the child's hand and wash the liquid off thoroughly with cold water. We would always advise going to see a doctor for further assessment after you wash the skin. If a child then puts his hands to his face, the liquid may cause serious damage to the structure of the eye, resulting in pain, distress and infection. The pod should be removed and all exposed surfaces washed with water, including the face and eye area, as well as they can tolerate. Any child with liquid tab contents in the eye needs to go to the hospital for review. We need to do a complete assessment of the eye and then wash it out with a lot of water to reduce the risk of further damage. If a child bites into or swallows a liquid tab, the contents may cause very serious effects like burns to the digestive system or breathing difficulties. All these cases need to be brought for assessment to a doctor or emergency department. When you and I get a cold, we tend to have a stuffy nose, we might have a temperature and we might have a slight cough. It gets better in a few days. If a small baby gets a cold, it can go down onto their chest and we call this bronchiolitis. So they start with the stuffy nose and the runny nose and then they develop a cough that seems to last sometimes forever. But generally it gets worse for about the first three or four days. The next three or four days are when you feel really worried because your baby doesn't seem to be getting better, but that's a normal pattern. And then after that, the baby gets better slowly, though sometimes the cough can be there for up to about four weeks. It's usually caused by a virus, so no antibiotic or medicine will help you get better faster. We usually recommend is that you just mind your baby, not too much handling, feed them little amounts and often, and they will get better by themselves. Some babies do need to come into hospital or do need a doctor. Key things to look out for are if you're just worried about your baby, if they're pale, if they look grey, if they look blue or tired or sweaty, if they're not really interested in their surroundings as much as they normally are. If their breathing is very fast or if they're having episodes where maybe they're even stopping breathing or if you notice that they haven't had a wet nappy in a while. If you're worried about any of these things, just pop into your doctor or bring them to your local hospital. What do you get for a euro these days? Well, not much. But with Everyday Savers from Dunn Stores, you can get a huge range of quality everyday items, many for one euro or less. Plus, with our 10 50 grocery voucher, you can save even more each time you shop. Dunn Stores, always better value but you suspect because of difficulty in breathing or circulatory collapse this may be happening then it is much safer to give adrenaline. Adrenaline is well tolerated by children and it is very unusual that it would do any harm to a child. If you have previously been considered at risk of anaphylaxis uh, by your doctor you should have been prescribed adrenaline and it should have been demonstrated to you uh, by the doctor or by the pharmacist. Once Adrenaline has been given. Other medications, if not already administered, can also be given, such as antihistamines or uh, asthma medications such as Ventolin. If after five minutes the child still remains symptomatic with shortness of breath or circulatory collapse, a second adrenaline pen can be administered in the same way as the first. However, if the child has improved significantly, then no uh, further treatment is required until emergency services arrive. If you are having anaphylaxis and you do not have access to adrenaline, then it is important that you phone 999 and state the words anaphylaxis. Lie the child flat or get them into the most comfortable position they can, uh, they can, they can manage. And if you have antihistamines available and they have not already been given, these can be administered. Otherwise, it is a case of waiting for emergency services to arrive who will carry adrenaline with them. It's important after adrenaline has been given or after anaphylaxis
that urgent medical attention is seen. Even if adrenaline has been given and there has been a significant improvement, children must go to hospital. We sincerely hope that you will never be faced with this scenario, but this skill is an easy and effective tool that may potentially save an infant's life. If your child is choking, he may appear distressed. He may have a silent cough or cry. His face will be pale and his lips may be blue. If this happens, supporting your baby's head and neck with his head lower than the level of his chest. In between his shoulder blades with the heel of your hand, you need to hit him hard five times. Don't worry One, about hurting two, your baby. Three, you need four, to relieve five. this obstruction. Generally, back blows are enough to relieve the obstruction, but if your baby is still not breathing, you need to do five chest thrusts. This is done by using your two fingers in between the nipples, the lower half of his breastbone, going on an inward and upward motion to your baby's head. One, two, three, four, five. You're going to continue doing chest thrusts and back blows until the object comes out or your baby goes unresponsive. If your baby goes unresponsive, you need to follow the guidelines for infant CPR. If you see the object in your baby's mouth and it is easy to remove, remove it. However, never put your finger blindly into your baby's mouth as you could push the object further back or you could injure the inside of their mouth causing more problems. If your child has had a choking episode, they need to be followed up by a doctor. Burns in children make up a significant proportion of our emergency department attendances. The majority of burns we see are caused by scalds from hot liquids and affect infants and toddlers. This is often due to their quick, unpredictable movements. We also see contact burns from heated appliances such as hair straighteners and irons. If your infant or child has sustained a burn or scald to the eyes, nose, mouth or neck, you must seek medical attention from your nearest emergency department immediately as their vision or breathing might be compromised. If other areas are affected, you must still plan to seek medical attention, but in these cases it's safe to take a few minutes to apply some first aid measures at home. The first step is to cool the affected area under cold running water for at least 15 to 20 minutes. You may use a tap or a shower. This may be distressing for small children, but it is the most important measure to prevent further ongoing heat damage under the skin. The water temperature does not have to be freezing, 15 degrees Celsius is ideal, and remember to never use ice on a burn. The second step is to take off any wet or burnt clothing. If a piece of your child's clothes appears to be stuck to their skin, do not peel it away. Leave it in place and cut away the clothing around it. Many parents apply household products such as butter and grease to burns and scalds. We do not recommend applying anything to the burnt area until it has been seen by a medical practitioner. Greasy substances will only keep the heat in and slow down the healing process. Skin that has been burnt will often form blisters. If this occurs, do not pop the blisters at home as this is your body's way of preventing a skin infection. Remember, burnt skin is extremely painful, so please give your child some pain relief as soon after the burn as possible. There is no medical reason to cover a fresh burn. However, if the burnt area is at risk of rubbing against objects or sun exposure on your way to the GP or emergency department, you may want to loosely wrap a clean, light cloth like a muslin or gauze around your child's burn. Do not apply anything tight to the area. The burns we see are almost always preventable. When minding small children, never leave hot drinks or dishes uncovered. Always keep heated appliances such as hair straighteners, kettles and irons out of reach. Never leave a mobile child unattended. Never leave a baby in the care of their young sibling with no adult supervision. And always check your child's bath water temperature with a thermometer before placing your child in it. This information is intended for first aid only. Always seek medical advice for burns and scalds, no matter how minor they seem.
Happily, meningitis is much less common than before due to vaccination, but it's always wise to be on the alert for it. Watch out for a fever with a developing rash, which does not fade when you press against it, a high-pitched cry and marked pallor. These are features of meningococcal infection and need medical attention immediately. Also beware of the child who has had chickenpox for the past three days and who then develops a second wave of temperature and a spreading red rash or reddened areas around the chickenpox spots. It may be that the chickenpox spots have become infected, but you need to be on your guard for a bug called Strep A. This is a very nasty bug that can sweep through the system. If you suspect this, seek medical attention immediately. Mild headache, tender bruising, mild swelling of the scalp or mild dizziness. If your child experiences these mild symptoms after a knock, a bump or a blow to the head, you do not require any specific treatment. Require any specific treatment. Observe them closely for 48 hours and monitor whether their symptoms improve or worsen. The serious symptoms to know about are unconsciousness, either very briefly or for a longer period of time. Difficulty staying awake or being sleepy several hours after the injury. Having a seizure or a fit. Difficulty speaking such as slurred speech. Vision problems or double vision. Difficulty understanding what people say. Reading or writing problems. Balance problems or difficulty walking. Loss of power in part of the body such as weakness of an arm or a leg, pins and needles in the hands or the feet, memory loss, such as not being able to remember what happened before or after the injury, clear fluids leaking from the nose or ears since the injury, a black eye with no other damage around the eye, bleeding from one or both ears, new deafness, a loss of hearing in one or both ears, bruising behind one or both ears, or a lasting, strong, persistent headache since the injury, vomiting since the injury, irritability or unusual behavior, visible damage to the head such as open, bleeding, wound. If any of these symptoms are present, particularly the loss of consciousness, even for a short period of time, immediately go to the emergency department of your local hospital or call 999 or 112 and ask for an ambulance. For parents, one of the most frightening things that can happen is that their baby stops breathing. Follow these simple steps to administer CPR. Gently stimulate the baby by tapping the foot or squeezing the hand. Shout for help if there's no response, but remain with the baby. Gently Tilt the head into the neutral position to open the airway. Have a quick look in the mouth to see if there is anything visible. If there is, lift it out. With the head in this position, check for breathing. Look for a rise and fall in the chest and tummy. Listen for breath sounds. Feel for air from the baby's mouth on your cheek, taking no longer than 10 seconds. If your baby's not breathing, Give five rescue breaths by blowing gently into the lungs, covering the baby's nose and mouth, ensuring there is good seal and you can see the chest rising. Each breath you give should be approximately one second in duration. If there are no signs of life, example eyes opening or limb movement, the baby's heart may not be beating properly and you must begin compressions on the chest. Place the tips of two fingers on the lower half of the breast bone and push the chest down gently but firmly to a depth of four centimeters. Push fast for a count of 30. Then give two breaths, followed by 30 compressions.
Continue this sequence for one full minute. After this, if you are still on your own, make a call to the ambulance stating your emergency. Return quickly to the baby and begin with compressions, alternating breaths as seen until the baby responds or you can hand over to the ambulance. Most poisonings we see in the emergency department occur in toddlers. Common substances are medicines and household cleaning agents. Most children with accidental poisoning do fine, but many substances have potential for very serious consequences. The commonest medicines ingested would be liquid paracetamol or ibuprofen. Most parents don't realise how dangerous paracetamol can be. Children may also take medicines which belong to an adult family member. A single tablet of some of these can be fatal to a toddler. For example, certain blood pressure medications, antidepressants or tablets for diabetes. Other common but dangerous medicines include iron supplements and aspirin. Household cleaning agents are often quite corrosive. A very small amount can cause burns to the mouth and throat resulting in pain and damage. Antifreeze for cars contains an extremely toxic alcohol. A very small quantity is poisonous. If you find a child with medicine or household agents, stay calm. Remove the poison from the child. Wash any visible product off the skin with plenty of water, including the eyes. Do not give a drink unless advised to do so. Never force the child to vomit. Call Poison's information. If the child collapses or has a difficulty breathing, call an ambulance. Go to the emergency department and bring the medicine or solution with you. Usually, when a child accidentally drinks a poison, it's because someone has transferred it into a water or soft drink bottle. That's why cleaning products or weed killers should never be decanted from their original packaging. It is likely that nearly all children will need to take medicine at some point during childhood and we know from talking to parents that this can be a worry at times. As well as providing you with the medicine your child may need, your local pharmacist is always available to help with any queries or concerns you may have in relation to your child's health. If you find it difficult to read and understand prescriptions or instructions, don't be afraid to ask us for help. Your pharmacist can easily explain them to you. Every pharmacy has a private consultation room, which you are more than welcome to use if you would feel more comfortable speaking in private. It is so important that you read the instructions carefully. No matter how well you think you know your child's medicine, check what it is, what it is for, and how to use it. It can be a good idea to keep a log to record doses given. This can help when multiple people are giving your child medicine throughout the day. It is important to use a correct measuring device, for example an oral syringe or measuring cup or spoon, to ensure you are giving an accurate dose to your child. Avoid teaspoons as these can vary widely. Remember, when medicine is not taken properly, it can cause more harm than good. And for this reason, we always need to ensure that we keep medicines out of reach and sight of children. Some medicines may need to be stored in the fridge and out of direct sunlight. Again, make sure your little one won't be able to get to the medicines themselves. Read the storage instructions or ask your pharmacist if you are unsure. Also, if you need to take medicines yourself, don't take them in front of children as they often copy what they see adults doing. Medicines can interact with other medicines, vitamins and even food, so make sure you let your doctor or pharmacist know if your child is taking any other medicines. This will help you to use the medicine safely and will help avoid taking things that don't mix well together. Do not use any medicine past its expiry date as it may not work as well and may be harmful. Don't destroy or throw out unused or out of date medicines yourself. Return them to your pharmacist who can destroy them safely. Please feel free to visit your local pharmacist for further advice and support. We are here to help.
Don't get much for a euro these days? You do, with new everyday savers from Dunn Stores, like our award-winning bolognese sauce. Just one of hundreds of our quality everyday items. For one euro or less, Dunn Stores. Always better value. Lyme disease is a bacterial infection that is spread to humans by infected ticks. Lyme disease is not contagious. Although Lyme disease is not a common infection, we do see a higher number of cases in the west of Ireland due to the large national park in Connemara. The ticks that cause Lyme disease are commonly found in woodland and park areas. This is because these types of habitats have a high number of tick carrying animals such as deer, mice and sheep. Due to their breeding patterns, the tick population is highest in late spring and early summer. If a tick bites an animal that has the bacteria, they can also become infected with it. The tick can then transfer the bacteria to a human by biting them and feeding on their blood. In general, the longer the tick has been attached to the skin, the greater the risk of passing on the infection. It is uncommon for the infection to be passed in the first hours after a bite which is why it is so important to look for ticks and to remove them. The problem is that the ticks are very small and they do not cause pain, so it can be difficult to realise that you have a tick attached to your skin. The most common symptom of early stage Lyme disease is the appearance of a distinctive skin rash that is known as erythema migrans. This is also referred to as a target lesion. This rash looks like a bullseye in the centre of a dartboard and develops at the site of the tick bite. The skin affected by the rash will look red and feel slightly raised to the touch. The size of the rash can range from small to large. Other symptoms of early stage Lyme disease may include the following. Fatigue or tiredness, muscle pain, joint pain, headache, fever, chills and sometimes neck stiffness. Risk factors for Lyme disease include any activity or occupation that involves prolonged exposure to woodland and park areas like hiking, camping and outdoor picnics. Lyme disease can be a difficult condition to diagnose. While the characteristic skin rash can provide an important clue, not everyone with Lyme disease may develop the rash. Oral antibiotics are recommended for the treatment of early stage Lyme disease. You can reduce the risk of infection by being aware of ticks and which areas they normally live in, wearing appropriate clothing in tick infested areas like a long sleeved shirt and trousers tucked into your socks, using insect repellents, inspecting your skin for ticks, particularly at the end of the day, including your head, neck, hairlines and skin folds, which includes your armpits, groin and waistband. Making sure that your children's head and neck areas, including scalps, are properly checked. Checking that ticks are not brought into your home, on your clothes. 
and checking that pets do not bring ticks into your home in their fur. If you find a tick on your skin or your child's skin, you should remove it by gently gripping it as close to the skin as possible, preferably using a fine toothed tweezers and pulled steadily away from the skin. If you are worried that your child may be developing Lyme disease after a tick bite, you should go to your GP or go to your nearest emergency department to have your child seen. So, uh, food allergy affects approximately 3% of young children. That's roughly one in every 30 children, mostly young children. Uh, the commonest allergen amongst Irish children would be egg white, and most children are exposed to egg white in the form of scrambled eggs, which is partially cooked egg. The other allergens that are rec recognised would be milk, uh, notably cow's milk, and then nuts, probably peanut, and the tree nuts. Approximately 1% of children have peanut allergy. Typically the reaction that parents will notice with a food allergy is a rash on the skin, which is usually a redness around the lips or the mouth, redness on the chin, uh, redness around the eyes, or they may have a hive or nettle sting-like rash. They can also get swelling of the lips or swelling around the eyes. In some instances, food allergy reactions can be more severe, such as with coughing or wheezing or other airway difficulties. Children may also get vomiting and abdominal pain, and these would certainly be more severe type reactions, but are less common. The majority of food allergic reactions in children are managed with an over-the-counter antihistamine, which is typically given by mouth. These have a prompt and immediate effect. In certain situations, such as those children with more significant reactions, they certainly may need to have an adrenaline pen as part of their allergy action plan. Majority of food allergies in children will resolve by late childhood, and this is certainly true for milk allergy and egg allergy. However, certain nut allergies will persist through to adulthood, and we are well aware of many patients with peanut and tree nut, which are almonds, Brazil nut, walnut, etc., persisting through to adulthood. If you have any concerns about your child having had a reaction to a foodstuff, you should contact your primary care provider. More information is available on the Irish Food Allergy Network for parents, and risk factors for more severe reactions would include severe or poorly controlled asthma. So certainly if your child has had a reaction to a foodstuff and also has a diagnosis of asthma, you should obtain further information and contact your primary care provider and then ultimately uh, secondary level care through an allergy clinic. hundreds of children. Today, because of vaccines, it is extremely rare to die from these diseases in Ireland. Vaccines work by triggering our immune system to fight certain diseases. If a vaccinated person comes in contact with these diseases, their immune system is able to respond more effectively, either by preventing disease or reducing its severity. Getting your child vaccinated helps protect others in your community, like your neighbour who has cancer and cannot get certain vaccines, or your friend's newborn baby who is too young to be fully immunised. When everyone in a community who can get vaccinated does get vaccinated, it prevents the spread of disease and can slow or stop an outbreak. Routine vaccines protect against 14 childhood diseases, including whooping cough, measles, German measles, meningitis and pneumonia. Two vaccines also protect against cancer, the HPV vaccine and the hepatitis B vaccine. 
The recommended vaccine schedule is designed to protect infants and children early in life when they are most vulnerable. Their immune systems are not yet fully mature, making it easier for bacteria and viruses to multiply. Booster vaccines are given when children start primary and secondary school as they are exposed to more children and therefore to more infections. Childhood immunisations are recommended at 2, 4 and 6 months, 12 and 13 months, 4 to 5 years and 12 to 13 years. These vaccines are available free of charge for all children. To be fully immunised, children need all doses of all vaccines in the recommended schedule. If your child doesn't receive the full number of doses, they are vulnerable to serious diseases. You can obtain the latest schedule information by talking to your doctor or online at immunisation.ie. Vaccines are very safe, however, like all medications, vaccines may have side effects. While your child may experience some discomfort or tenderness at the injection site, this is minor compared to the serious complications that can result from the diseases that these vaccines prevent. A slight reaction actually shows that the vaccine is having the desired effect on the immune system. A child may also get a mild temperature, be out of sorts and off his or her food as a result of the vaccine, but these generally get better themselves in a day or two with cuddling. Serious side effects from vaccines are very rare. If you have any concerns about vaccine safety, mention them to your doctor. Your child should not be vaccinated if they have a fever over 38.5 degrees. Check with your doctor if your child has ever had an allergic reaction or is undergoing treatment such as cancer treatment, which suppresses their immune system. Keep a record of your child's vaccinations. To find out more about immunisation, go to www.immunisation.ie. Short stature is one of the commonest reasons for referral to a paediatric endocrinologist. Um, most children grow fastest in the first two years of life, so they grow between 30 and 35 centimetres. After that then growth is relatively steady throughout childhood, so they grow at 4 to 7 centimetres per year until puberty, at which stage then they have a growth spurt in line with puberty. And girls usually have their puberty growth spurt early at the start of puberty, whereas boys have their growth spurt later on. Some babies who are born big at birth may cross centiles in the first two years of life in line with their genetic potential. When assessing a child for a possible short stature, accurate height measurement is essential. And it's important that this is done by a fully trained nurse who has been trained in measuring height. We use a wall-mounted steadiometer to measure children in our paediatric clinics. It's also very important to know the parent's height in order to assess a child properly with short stature. Some children are small because they're from a small family and therefore knowing the parent's height is very helpful. The most common cause of short stature are familial short stature, but other conditions such as constitutional delay of growth and puberty, in other words, the child is a late developer, may mean that the child is short now but will have a growth spurt later on. Although most children referred to the paediatric clinic with short stature are normal or normal for their family, if the child has not grown at a normal rate or has fallen off their centiles, they may need to be investigated further. The causes of short stature are broad and include genetic conditions, problems with the thyroid gland, celiac disease and deficiency in growth hormone, among other conditions. Gastroesophageal reflux is called reflux for short. It is extremely common in all healthy infants where contents from the stomach backwash into the esophagus 30 or more times every day. Some of it will be vomited or spat out, but most slides back down into the stomach. The frequency of reflux declines as baby gets older and generally decreases towards the end of the first year of life and is unusual in children older than 18 months. 
In the majority of infants, a focused history and physical examination will confirm that the reflux is uncomplicated and little further evaluation or intervention is usually required. Simple measures will usually help control the symptoms, like positioning your baby upright after feeds for about 10 to 20 minutes as they get their wind up, elevating the head of the mattress in the bassinet or cot with a small rolled up towel underneath the mattress or thickening the feeds with a thickener. Warning signals that may suggest symptoms of obstruction or disease in a refluxing infant include the following. The presence of green bile in the vomit, gastrointestinal bleeding which is characterised by blood in the vomit or blood in the stools, consistently forceful vomiting after every feed, onset of vomiting after six months of life, abdominal tenderness, abdominal distension, recurrent pneumonias or chest infections, constipation and diarrhoea. Infants who have reflux and are not gaining the appropriate amount of weight for their age need to be seen by their GP or referred to a paediatrician for review. Reflux and poor weight gain also may be caused by food protein induced gastrointestinal disease and this is often referred to as cow's milk protein intolerance because cow's milk protein is the most common trigger. All formula milk or non-breast milk is made up of cow's milk and will contain the cow's milk protein, whey and casein. Breastfeeding children can also develop cow's milk protein intolerance. For mothers who are breastfeeding, if they have a high dairy intake in their daily diet, some of the cow's milk protein will pass directly into their milk and subsequently into their child when feeding them. Symptoms may include the following. Taking longer to feed, pulling off the breast or pulling off to the bottle after soon starting a feed, crying associated with feeds, difficulty to burp and wind after feeding, lifting their legs a lot and passing a lot of wind, or being unsettled while they sleep. For most formula fed infants with reflux and poor weight gain, which is thought to be due to cow's milk protein intolerance, we suggest a two week trial of an extensively hydrolyzed formula. For breastfeeding babies, we would advise the mums to remove all sources of beef and dairy from their diet and to replace with an equivalent substitute ensuring they are getting sufficient amounts of calcium and vitamin D in their daily intake. Products that contain cow's milk protein or dairy products include such items like milk, cheese, yogurts, chocolate, ice cream and cream. The response to this change is often more delayed than in formula fed infants because it takes some time to eliminate the offending protein from breast milk and small amounts of milk or beef protein may be found in foods. If there is not a clear response to the diet change during the trial, other diagnoses and treatments should be explored. If you are concerned, please see your GP or paediatrician. A key part of your child's development is their emotional well-being and mental health. This is just as important as their physical growth. All children will experience feelings and emotions that become overwhelming at times, and this is normal. Most children will overcome these difficulties with support, but sometimes, as a parent, you might become worried that your child is presenting with symptoms or with behaviours that concern you about their mental health. And this can be a really difficult time trying to figure out how to get help for your child. It's important to respond to these early signs or changes in your child's behaviour as soon as possible, as this will allow your family and your child to access help to move things forward. If you're worried about your child's mental health, the first step is to try to open up a conversation with them to understand what's going on. And this can be hard as a parent, but it's invaluable that your child knows that you're there for them at any point. And sometimes by doing this when driving in the car or when doing something together can be really much more successful because children often up, open up more when they don't feel on the spot or that they have to make direct eye contact. It's also important to try to not ask too many questions at this point and just let them talk. And if it's too hard to talk, you could encourage your child just to write down how they feel. 
young people worry about opening up. They worry that they won't be believed or that they won't be taken seriously when they tell their story. But if you listen without judgment or interruption, it can be a really helpful starting point for your child and really helps them to feel validated. For any parent or guardian, this isn't an easy conversation to have. Parents are often afraid to ask, are you okay? As they worry that they won't be able to deal with the answer. And I think it's really important to know that there is help and support out there and you're not alone. In terms of accessing help, talking to your GP is the best place to start. Your GP will be familiar with the local services in your area and be able to support you in figuring out what is wrong and where to access the appropriate help. And sometimes if your child has a conversation with your GP, this can also help to start to resolve the difficulty. Regardless of the level of severity of your child's mental health needs, the most important thing which you can do as a parent is to let your child know that you're there. And with the right level of support and treatment, young people can overcome their mental health difficulties and really learn lifelong skills and build their resilience. So with help and support, it doesn't have to feel as overwhelming as it might do at the start of this journey. On the 8th of January 2018, Sean came home from school and he was displaying flu-like symptoms and he said, I don't feel well, ma. I said, um, look, you're off tomorrow, have a rest. I gave him a Lemsip that evening and he went to bed. By Tuesday evening, he had been talking to his sister Zoe and he said, I don't feel 100%, he said. So on the Wednesday then, he was due back in school and he said to me, ma, I feel rotten. I said, OK, so I made an appointment for the GP that morning. GP checked him over. She said he has a bad influenza, high fever, chest infection. I'm going to give you an antibiotic in case it progresses to pneumonia. By Thursday, he was getting worse. By this time, Sean had shortness of breath, mottled skin, couldn't sleep, very, very irritable. And I was watching TV with him that night and about half 11, he stopped talking to me. And I knew straight away there was something wrong and Sean stopped breathing. And I called for Joe and I had to watch Joe give Sean CPR in front of me while I found the paramedics. And a half six on Friday the 12th of January, Sean passed away. So we knew nothing about sepsis. We never even heard of sepsis before it took Sean from us. Sean had no underlying health issues. He was a happy, healthy young man. You know, since then we found out that there's 15,000 reported cases of sepsis per year in Ireland, leading to 3,000 deaths per year. You know, people ask me what is sepsis and the easiest way I can explain to them is if you have an infection from anything and it's not getting better and you're displaying any of these signs and symptoms, even two, admit yourself to A&E and your child or your parent or anyone belonging to you and ask them could it be sepsis. For a euro these days? Well, not much. But with everyday savers from Dunn Stores, you can get a huge range of quality everyday items, many for one euro or less. Plus, with our 1050 grocery voucher, you can save even more each time you shop. Dunn Stores, always better value.